is very different. It offers a different view and it offers different obstacles. But eventually, when you climb to the very top of the mountain, as you get closer, after you've seen the views and you've addressed the obstacles, they begin to look more and more similar. And one of these paths could be religion, and one could be nationality or your culture. But after a while, as you get closer, you see the similarity is that they're all leading to one thing, to a feeling of being connected, connected to something greater than ourselves, something we can be united in, something we can be a part of. Of course, at the bottom of the mountain, the, the paths are so far apart, they seem so terribly different. We seem so terribly different on one level. But it's an illusion. It's, a, it's an illusion because at the top, what we will find is this oneness, this sense of connection. In the Tarot, it, it's a medium I use a lot, there's a card called the moon. And in this card, in the center of the card, is the path. And the path goes up and it goes down. And it goes up and it goes down. And it's under the moon, under the chaos and the wisdom of the moon, of the chaos and wisdom of life. Because our path does go up and down in our lives. And along the path, there are obstacles. One is the dog. On the side of the path, there's a picture of a dog in this card. Because it's that obedience. Do what you're told. And, and conform to what everybody asks of you. And that isn't falling off the path, but it can delay your progress a bit. <laughs> and then on the other side of the path is the wolf those raw, passionate desires. That's not falling off the path either. It's just, um, can delay you a while as well, because it's those, it's, you can dance with the wild side, but it's only a cul-de-sac, a place where you can stay for a while before life spits you out back onto your central path. <laughs> <laughs> and if you stay too long in either the dog or the wolf, um, then fate comes along and pries your fingers loose. Anything that you hold on to for too long that keeps you from progressing on your path. And so, when you get to the top, the high place in the path, it's so exhilarating. It, it's where you feel the bliss. And you look out at this vast landscape and you see your meaning and the purpose of your life. That's not what spirituality is about. But it feels really good. <laughs> What the real work is, is when you go down. And then you have to deal with all your undigested beliefs. You have to face all those things within yourself, or your religion, or your family, or your culture. But that's what we do. We, we digest beliefs, things that are misconstrued, especially those that are given to us by our culture, a paradigm that separates Everything's being separate. In our belief system, we have these polarities, this good and bad, us and them. But how do we get back to the circle when it's just us here, where it's all of us, just one big circular <coughs> planet, one family unit? Because we are all Gaeans. We all live on the same planet. But we need to wake up and and be the greatness that we're meant to be. How do we do that? Well, Lao Tse said, Lao Tse said, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So, where do we start? We're just so big. Well, we begin right here, right now, wherever we are. How do you want the world to be? You want it to be peaceful? Well, then that's assignment number one. We have to be peaceful. Yeah, but you know that guy who lives next door? He's always running his lawn mower when I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> He's so inconsiderate. How are you going to be peaceful when there's so many annoying people in the world? <laughs> <laughs> when there are people who don't care about the big issues and, and they laugh at you for caring. What can sustain you in your struggle to live your truth? 
to be who you truly are. What stands in your way? Well, well stupid people. <laughs> no, yes it can. All spiritual teachings say it's all about love. What is love? I once had a boyfriend who said I love you. I think he meant I own you, I possess you. I can do what I want with you. I had another lover who said I love you. Translation, you make me feel good. As long as you make me feel good, I want you. He never asked me what I wanted. Love can mean many, many things. And love can take many, many forms. Some are completely beyond our, our understanding, or so it seems. But in its simplest form, love is two forces connecting. Why don't we always connect? What stands in the way? In my understanding as a psychologist, what we do not like in ourselves, we will not tolerate in another. And that is the seed core of prejudice. And the process goes like this. We find something inside of ourselves that we just don't like. Probably because it's a belief people who get us. So we externalize it. We say, it's not in me, it's in that person. And we find someone to hang it on. And we don't like that person. We can hate that person. But it all starts with a part of ourselves that we don't like. In Yiddish, they have a concept called a miskite. Now, a miskite is a poor, pathetic little orphan. And the way I see it is there's this Norman Rockwell picture. Oh, it's Thanksgiving dinner, the whole family sitting around with the big turkey, the candles, the fireplaces lit. Everyone's having a wonderful time. The niece come? She's outside, in the snow, in the cold, shivering, looking through the window at everything that's happening. And when I was growing up, I thought I was the only person in the whole world who had a Miss Kite. And then, when I became a therapist, I found out that everybody, every human being, has a mise kite. Some are more prevalent than others, but everyone has one. So I became curious about my mise kite, and I wanted to get to know her. Given that I was terrified of her, I didn't want to be seen, because what if I was out public like right now? And talking, and she jumped out and embarrassed me. <laughs> so what I did to get to know her was I walked around my room and I looked for some object to embody the Mies kind. And I had a little statue that came from a dig in Crete. It was what, an authentic artifice, so it was very valuable. It was also really ugly. She was hunched over. She had one boob up here, one hanging down there. <laughs> fun on her head, and she just looks so miserable. Perfect. Perfect for my Miss Kite. I also have a big, beautiful goddess statue who has a dress draped over her lap. And so I put my Miss Kite in the lap of the goddess. And I sat there for an entire year, every day, I sat with the Miss Kite. Oh, it was painful. First, I judged her. I had a lot of judgments about that part of me, that ugly, duckling part of me. And then I remembered all the things she did to embarrass me. And I, I started thinking about all the times that I felt so hurt, or times when I went too far and got punished, or the times I was rejected for something other people didn't like about me. And I looked at all of her wounds, and, you know, I know all the right things to say and do. But she didn't. And if ever she showed up, I would be so embarrassed. She would just blow my reputation, you know. And so I was terrified that she'd pop out and make me look dumb. So I sat with her. I sat with her. Went through all my projections of all the things I was resentful about. And after a while, the image shifted. And it struck me that the brave little Miskite was my champion.
that she went into the world and she tested the boundaries. And she went too far and she got hurt. And she got punished. And she got humiliated. But she was brave. And I realized that instead of being embarrassed by this part of me, I should thank the misguided. Because she earned all the polish I had today. She worked out all the rough edges. And instead of being embarrassed, I should honor her sacrifices. Because each of her scars was a ladder that I climbed to reach the realm of spirit. Of course, at the time, it felt like trudging through the wire. But those were the times when I either jumped into God's lap and he saved me, or I sank into the arms of the mother and she loved me, or my brothers and my sisters came out with a net to catch me. And quite often, I just girdled my loins and found out what I was really made of. All those experiences rounded out the beautiful creature I am today. Now, I'm not perfect, but I am perfectly me. My quirks and my oddities, my gifts and my tangled, sometimes torturous, sometimes blissful process, all of it is my niece kind. And I've come to love her and love myself. This process gave me a feeling of innocence. It's odd, but facing all that everything made me feel innocent. Like my heart is open, like a child's heart is open. And the good stuff pours through and the bad stuff pours through. But I, I'm willing to face all the experiences. Like Ruth said, it's the yes. It's coming to me like. And and just willing to accept all the ecstasy and the despair. Hopefully there's more ecstasy. It's all about the journey and doing the journey well. Because there are these roads that are paved with hate and prejudice, blame, guilt, internal turmoil, sinners, and original sin. There are roads where you hate yourself and you project the hatred outward. And we blame someone and you have to hit someone because you need a place to put all those terrible uglinesses that people think are inside of themselves. Or you can love your ugly little orphan. You can love it with its imperfections and love it for its process of becoming. We can love ourselves because we are a unique combination <coughs> of elements. The elements that make up who we are, oh, they're all recycled. Sure, they move through the family and the culture and the religion. But this combination of, of elements put together that you, each of you, each of us are, is completely unique, and it's only here once. And so we look at this combination with all your magnificence and all your shadows, <laughs> And we're alive here now. What is the special soul mission that you're here to fulfill? Everyone has one. Sure, we have our struggles, but that's the static. The real interesting part of life is what are you contributing to life? What are you creating? What are you contributing to the lives of the people around you? That's the, the juicy, exciting part of life. When you're at peace with yourself, you can be at peace with around you, even when they're in turmoil. Like you go, to those, you go to the grocery store and the clerk just had this really miserable interaction with the last customer and she turns to you, yeah, what do you want? And, and you want to get angry, you know, because you didn't do anything. Basically, her agitation resonates with your own, oops, no jewelry touching, with your own <laughs> irritation frustrations you carry in your own life. And so when she barks at you, it sparks your anger. Her anger sparks your anger. And you respond. But what if, what if you're not carrying around a lot of frustration? What if you don't carry the anger? What if you let it just all pour through? Then there's nothing to resonate with. And so when she barks at you, it's just that it just feels easy to move to compassion and say some kindness to her to make her feel better. Because if we love ourselves, we're more in a position to love others. If we have compassion for our own pain, we are in a position to have compassion for the others. If we focus
focus on, on love and light, then there's no room for the darkness inside. And in that light, we can attract certain people and events that we can work together to heal this wounded world. And this world needs a lot of healing. Because right now, we stand at the crossroads of time. We have an opportunity to set patterns that will last for 26,000 years. That's a full platonic year that starts in our lifetime. We can seed the next 2,160 years, because that's the Aquarian age that started in the early 1980s. Or we can be guided by the Star of Bethlehem, the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that happened also in the early 80s that ushers in a new age. There are many ancient systems like the Mayan calendar that all ended in our time. Jesus was born at the beginning of the Piscean age, the age that has just ended. So we, all of us on the planet today, are the flagship into the Aquarian age. We're the chosen ones who have incarnated at this time to heal this planet. We are the ones who are alive at the crossroads. All through the ages, all the mystics have wondered and speculated about our time. Not our parents' generation or our children's, but our time. For thousands of years. Because when you study the ancient wisdom, you see this figure eight. It goes like that, it's like an eight laying on its side. And it's the symbol of infinity. It's the symbol of time, and it's the key to time travel. Well, in this wheel of time, when humanity was out here on the outer edges of that cycle, it took vast amounts of men and money and materials to change somebody's beliefs, to change the way life is. But people with wise men would look at that and they go, wow, if it takes that much, what happens here? What happens when these grand cycles of time cross here? What about that generation that lives in the time when the smallest flick of a finger, when the smallest piece of uh, use of energy propels you from this cycle to the next cycle? When you start something and it has a life cycle of 26,000 years, what is it going to be like on the planet then? I could see two mystics in the Middle Ages saying, hey, you want to live then? When every aspect of life will be subject to change? Well, they marveled at that kind of responsibility. And in this whirling chaos that we have today, where everything is uncertain because we live in that center, that vortex of time, between two great cycles, what are we going to do with that? Well, I'd like to just hang out with my friends and love them, actually. <laughs> and, and then we can be a generating force of love. And wherever we interact in the world, we just read a little bit of the good stuff. I mean, what is a better world like mission than that? To just add more love to the world. <laughs> because this time that we live in, it, it's like that, that moment when they lift the chute and the bull runs out and someone's got to ride it. And the question is, how well are we going to ride this time? in our own lives as we deal with our own, what seems like our own petty problems. But we, we think of it in a new way, we address it in a new way, we implement something new, and that's the little acorn. I read recently that, that it's from the little, if the little acorn holds on long enough, it becomes the big oak tree or something like that. If we can take our beliefs and just hold on to them long enough, seed them. They'll flower over the next 26,000 years into something beautiful. So, yes, the outer world looks chaotic and the challenges look vast. But if we can love our misguided, 
If we can hold our own center, we can have compassion and love for the people around us. It's the ripple tide that moves out to the world. And as we tackle our problems and come up with our own solutions, loving solutions, we're seeding a whole new culture as all these cycles unfold. Jesus said, love thy neighbor as thyself. And when people shorten it, they say, love thy neighbor. But I don't think that's the operative part of the sentence. I think it's as thyself. Love thyself. Because if you can love yourself, then you can love someone else. So, I think that Jesus is that Atman, that, that point where we are both human and divine. And however you see it, every one of us has a part within us that is human and transcendent. And we can see that part just with something, the simplest thing in the world, conscious breath. Just taking a deep breath and recognizes that we're not this Robotron that responds to the world. We are a vessel for these sublime forces. And in the midst of chaos, life is miraculous, not just in concept, but in every breath we take. Because to be alive on this planet at this time is a very, very great gift. I said death, that's an interesting one. But it's a gift, especially if we live it with kindness. Especially if we have compassion for people. Because everyone is struggling with their own miskite. And that's the path 